Okay. So this week's parish is parish Vayechi, and it's Shabbos Chazak, which means that it's the last parsha of this sefer. So we have the Chamesh Chumash Torah, the Chumash, the first and foremost book of the Torah Shabbos of the written Torah is the five books of Moses. The first of those books is Bereshis, aka Genesis, and this week we will be reading the last Torah portion in that book, which is why it's called Shabbos Chazak. Um, <coughs> Now, we have always, of course, some very interesting and very important lessons to take away from the parasha. We see something very interesting about Yosef. In the opening of this week's parasha, early on, Yosef tells the rest of his extended family who were there that he foretells about the exodus from Egypt. He tells them that, you know, there's going to be a time and there's going to be difficult times and then Hashem will remember you and take you out. And when he does, Yosef requests, please remember to take my coffin, to take my bones out of the land of Israel. Sorry, out of the land of Egypt with you. And so Yosef, we, we see here really a, that, that Yosef had a connection to their slavery in Egypt, not just in terms of its opening, because Yosef really, if we had to pick one person who played the most pivotal role in the descent, I guess we could call it, of the Jewish people or his family, who would become the Jewish people from Israel into Egypt, really it was Yosef. I mean, there was no one who played nearly as central a role as Yosef. Yosef is the one who interpreted Paro's dreams who gave him the advice to stock up food in the years of plenty in advance of, in anticipation of the famine, who was ruling the land of Egypt. And as a result of the fact that he was ruling the land of Egypt and accumulating and storing up food in advance of the famine, when the famine came, everyone came to Egypt for food, including his family, which is how they eventually got landed up. They got stuck there, which led on to the slavery of several centuries. So, Yosef really is, by far and away, the single most central individual in terms of the arrival of his family to Egypt. And we see here that he also had a connection with the Exodus from Egypt. He was the one who foretold... Now, Hashem had foretold this whole story, the descent... Well, not specifically Egypt, but Hashem told Avraham several generations prior. Avraham was Yosef's great grandfather, Yosef's father and all of his brothers. Their father was Yaakov, grandfather was Yitzchak, great grandfather was Avraham. Hashem had told Avraham, your descendants are going to be strangers in a land strangers in a land that doesn't belong to them, etc, etc, and they're going to be oppressed, it's going to be a difficult time. And eventually they will go out, they will leave this land Berchush Godel with great wealth. So this had been foretold already generations prior, but Yosef now was having this dialogue with the people who were actually there in Egypt, and he was telling them, guys, it's going to be tough, there's going to be a long haul, Hashem will take you out in the right time, it'll happen, and then he requested that when that does happen, please remember to take my remains out of this land, out of Egypt. So Yosef really had a very strong connection to this whole saga, this whole, the slavery in Egypt, the exodus from Egypt. Yosef was the one, you know, was pivotal in terms of the beginning of this slavery actually happening. He was also the one who brought the message to the Jewish people well before Moshe Rabbeinu, well before Moses. He brought that message and said, before it even started, he said, it's going to happen you're going to have to grin and bear it. It's going to be over. It's happening for a discreet time. Hashem is going to take you out and it's going to be okay. It's going to end. And with this, it's actually said that he wasn't just informing them of what was going to happen. He was actually, in a sense, paving the way for it to happen. And just a story that kind of illustrates what I mean when I say that. Um... I mentioned it recently, I'm not sure whether or not it was in this class specifically, but there's a story with the base Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch. He actually had, we could almost call it like a, a personal angel. He had this angel that he would interact with. He called it the Magid. And he had a very special experience that most people don't get to have in this relationship. And 
he once had a story where he was working on something. And this is, we're talking about Rabbi Yosef Cairo, the man who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, wrote the Code of Jewish Law. He was undoubtedly one of the greatest Torah giants of the last, I would say, millennium, probably. Um, and he had this question once that he was trying to figure out in his Torah study. He came across a question and he couldn't get it. And he was working at it and working at it and working at it, trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out. Eventually, he got an answer after an incredible amount of effort and time that he had spent focusing and thinking and researching and digging and digging and digging in the texts and digging within himself to try to get there. Eventually, he resolved it. And for him, this was like a huge event. The fact that he finally resolved this problem that he had, that he worked so hard to figure out. And then down the line, he was traveling and he was in a shul somewhere and he came, you know, he was traveling low key. Um, incognito and he's just sitting on the side and there's some tourist study going on and he's sitting there listening to the discussions overhearing what's going on and he hears some some study people are studying they're studying the material that he had had this question on and someone asks a question and da, 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 boom gives an answer and he was just and he was heartbroken really he had spent so much time and effort and worked and broken himself and just worked, put, invested such a huge amount of time and effort to get to this answer. And here he is. He sees someone else ask the question, boom, gets an answer, moves on as if it was nothing and nothing even happened. It was just like the answer was so simple that they just moved on and kept going. And he was really, really hurt. And the market actually came and explained to him and said, you don't, it's okay. You don't have to be so upset. What happened here is, it's not that, these people didn't need to work and you did because they were greater than you are or they had merited to some sort of gift that allowed them to earn this that you had to work for and they earned it so simply. He said, what happened was this idea, the answer to this question, it exists and it existed. It's an idea in Torah. It's part of divine wisdom and it existed, but it existed in the realms of divinity. This concept, this idea had not yet been brought inside the confines of the physical reality, of the physical world that's governed by the rules of physical nature. It, th that concept didn't exist inside of this framework yet. And to take something that exists in the realms of divinity and to bring it down, to import it into the material world and to make it accessible to the human brain takes a tremendous amount of work. You took something, you imported something from the realms of divinity into the physical world, which then allowed it to be accessible to the human mind. Once you did that, once you brought it here, that meant that as a result, it was now accessible and other people would be able to access this idea and to reach this conclusion very easily. Not because they were capable or merited something greater than what you did, but because you did the hard work for them. When you worked and worked until you resolved this issue and got to this answer, what you did was you brought that idea, that concept into the world and made it accessible for everyone else. So when he, when the base Yosef worked on getting to this solution, he wasn't just doing something personal. He was paving the way for other people to be able to do their part too. When Yosef, Yosef did something similar here. When Yosef told his extended family, he said, Hashem is going to take you out of here. <coughs> that statement that he made was actually taking Hashem's commitment that he had made to our from generations earlier and cementing it into this place with these people. So his statement wasn't just a statement of fact. It wasn't just words. He was actually grounding that idea and that commitment that Hashem had made to Avram. And remember when, the, when Hashem made the commitment to Avram, it was very generic. It didn't say it was going to be in Egypt. He didn't say exactly when it was going to be, which generation it was going to be, which time it was going to be, where it was going to be, who these people that were going to oppress them were going to be. It was very generic. Now that it was starting to happen, Yosef took that commitment that Hashem gave Avram and said, I'm going to take them out with great wealth. And he was cementing it into these people in this time and in this place. So Yosef actually had 
also had a very important role to play in the exodus from Egypt. Even though he wasn't around, he had died way earlier. But he had still had a part to play in making it happen because his statement cemented Hashem's commitment into these people in this place and was... I mean, there are various different expressions. It's called Psichas or opening the pipe. It's paving the way. He paved the way for this to actually happen. But it would have happened anyway. It would have happened. The question is, what would it have taken to make it happen? These other people may have gotten to that conclusion if the base Yosef hadn't done the work, but it may have taken them however many hours he invested, it may have taken them 10 or 20 times as many hours to get there. He paved the way he did his work, which made it accessible to them. It may be that they would have gotten it anyway, but he made it, he removed a lot of the barriers. Right? So barriers don't necessarily mean that a person's not going to achieve something. A barrier means that there's going to be more difficult. There are things standing in the way. So he removed barriers, which made it more accessible, relatively speaking. That's a good question. So... What is it about Yosef exactly? Out of all of them, there was Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Yosef had 11 brothers. What was it about Yosef specifically that meant that he had to be the pivotal individual in the descent into Egypt, the lead up into the slavery in Egypt, and then the exodus from Egypt? Now... I'm just thinking, like, it's a bunch of thoughts, but I'm just thinking that he's your sword, so he had to elevate it to lowest to the highest. Like yes, okay. that, that's a big part of where we're going. I'm not sure how much we're going to get specifically into that in detail. It depends on okay. how things go. But that that's, uh, in terms of the spiritual anatomy of it, that is, yeah, yes, basically in short. <laughs> um, so... I had such a deep connection because I, I don't, like when you st- see the story of the, the, the person who, who uh, the Ramah... It was Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Right. Like what he had to work through, I feel like I so I, con- I connected to the story and my own personal experience, and then it makes sense that I was just safe. So it's just very cool. Wow. Okay. Good. Yeah. There's an, an expression that says, Ein chokham kabal There's no one who has, who's wise, who has insight, like someone who's actually yeah. been through the challenge. So part of it is that when we've been through something, we connect to it and we recall it quickly and easily and we connect to it in a very deep way because the connection we form to something through experience is very different to the connection we form to something through hearing about it or reading about it or learning it. So, um, And so now we're going to see... Looking at Yosef's life experience and who he, who he was and the unique gifts that he had, and then looking at the purpose and function of the exodus into Egypt and the subsequent the exodus into Egypt, the slavery in Egypt, the descent into Egypt, and then the subsequent exodus from Egypt, we will be able to see the connection between the two and why it is that Yosef specifically was the one who had to fulfill this role and had this special connection. So, it says about the Ovois, the Ovois, the forefathers, again, the F-O-R-E fathers, not the F-O-U-R fathers, because there were three of them, the three forefathers, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, it talks about them in Kabbalah, in Zohar, and it says that they are related to the first of the three middas, the three primary middas, the three primary emotional elements in the structure of ten that makes up everything. Nefesh Abahamis, animal soul, divine soul, every physical, every reality, physical and spiritual, etc., etc. Now, primarily in the context of the world of Atsilos, what are called the Midas of Atsilos, these emotional elements within the structure of the world of Atsilos, which is, we generally talk about, if we take the bulk of the spiritual reality that exists... For the most part, it's generally referred, divided up into four general realities or worlds, which are Atzilus, Bri, The highest, the most ethereal, the least materialistic of them, and by materialistic, I don't mean physical material necessarily, because all of them are spiritual. There is no physical material. But the least 
self-centered, the, the most in touch with God, with the creator, with the full truth of all of those is the word, world of Atsilos. It's the highest and the first. The name Atsilos comes from the Hebrew word Eitzel, which means close to, in proximity. Because this world is the first stage in the downward spiritual evolution, in the descent and the, the a series of decreases in being in touch with the source and the full truth, a.k.a. God and the recognition of the fact that everything comes directly from God, the more one is in touch with that, the less one has a sense of independent significance. It doesn't mean that one ceases to exist because we exist, we do exist, it's a reality, but the greater our awareness and the greater the degree to which we are in touch with the full truth, the less self-centered we are, the less our experience is dominated by a sense of self and the less we feel a sense of independent significance. We don't have less, we, we don't cease to exist, but we cease to feel ourselves as ourselves as much as we feel ourselves as part of this big picture, which is the full truth. The world of Atsilos is very high up in this chain of downward spiritual evolution. It's eight cell. It is in proximity to the source. Now, that doesn't mean geographically because it's not a physical place. There is no physical geography in spirituality, but it's the most in touch. It's the closest in terms of its awareness and experience. So this reality, this world, this space known as Atsilos is eight cell. It's close. It's very much in touch with and aware of its source and the full truth. So that it, this is the four, first and the highest of the four worlds, Atsilos, Bri, Yitzir, Asiya. In Atsilos, the same way that, and the Altrebbe talks about this in Tanya, it says in the beginning of chapter 3 in Tanya that each soul, each nefesh, has 10 bechinos, 10 levels, which correspond to, which are equivalent to the 10 spheros in the spiritual worlds, in the worlds above, because they evolve from them. What that means is that our soul, the godly soul, is a part of Hashem. It's part of the Creator. Each of us has a different soul, right? We're not all the same. We have different personalities. We have different minds. We have different perspectives. We have different cognitive abilities, different academic performances, different emotional profiles, very different, every single one of us. So if we all have a part of God and there's only one God, how does that happen? And the answer is that these little... <coughs> so to speak, pieces of God are processed. They pass through this series of realities. As a result of this process, they become progressively less in touch with what they are and where they come from. They develop more of a sense of self, of independence. And the journey that every soul takes through this process of development is different. So each soul comes out differently. Each soul ends up in a different place. But because they pass through these four worlds, Atsilos, Bria, Atsira, Asiya, each of which is made up of this equivalent system of the same ten parts, all of these exist in each of those realities. The soul, the nefesh, and this is true of the animal soul and the divine soul, both have ten primary elements which have the same ten names. Now, they're different. Chesed in a person, our tendency to be kind, isn't the same thing as chesed in the world of Atsilos, because Atsilos is in a person. But, at the, but they are equivalent. The chesed that we have is the equivalent of chesed and Atsilos in a very different context, in a different environment. So the same way that we, we talk about chesed and gvura, kindness and strength, being giving versus being demanding, in the context of the the one the, the context in which we can relate to it the best is the context of the human experience. Chesed and Gvura, the ideas of Chesed and Gvura exist in these worlds above as well. Chesed of Atsilos isn't human kindness. It's something completely different. Human kindness is number one, the best metaphor that we have for it. Number two, Chesed of Atzilos has an equivalent function in a different context. Chesed, this attribute of kindness, of giving nature, giving kindness in the human soul, 
is the human soul equivalent of chesed in atzilus, and it, it is the developmental result of chesed of atzilus, because because our souls pass through these worlds, they have taken on, they have been developed with an equivalent system, an equivalent structure. So our souls, in our souls we have chesed. And just to clarify, gvura, when we say gvura means being strong, strength, being strict, being demanding. It's not talking about being cruel. We're not talking about being mean. Boundaries. Talking about boundaries is a very big part of it. Boundaries come from having a sense of strength. Being demanding isn't being mean. In some ways, a demanding teacher is being a better teacher to the students than a kind teacher is in some ways. Being a kind, giving teacher who just gives information has upsides that being a demanding teacher doesn't have. Being a demanding teacher has upsides that being a giving teacher doesn't have. Gvura is not talking about being mean. It's talking about being strong and demanding. They're both positive things. Or they can be, depending on the context. So chesed and gvura and tiferes, these first three attributes, chesed, we could call kindness, Gvura is strength, and Tiferes is beauty, it's Rachamim, it's mercy, it's a melding of the two. It's bringing Chesed and Gvura, kindness and strength together. These three middos are described in Zohar as being primarily associated with Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Avram is the personification of Chesed, of Atzilus. Yitzchak is the personification of Gvura, and Yaakov is the personification of Tiferes. So that mean Yosef is Nesach? No, he's not. Yosef is primarily Yosef. Um... He's called Yosef HaTzadik, and it says Tzadik Yosod Olam. So, Yosef is primarily associated with Yosod. Um, but we're going to see something interesting in a posuk from earlier on, that it says, Eile Toldos Yaakov Yosef. These are the offspring, the progeny of Yaakov, Yosef. What does that mean? What's it telling us? Why does the Pesach structure this way? That these Now, the, the verse continues. It's not just these are the progeny of Yaakov, Yosef, period, end of story. But that phrase exists. Why is it that Yosef is considered, at least in the context of this verse, to be the primary element of the progeny of Yaakov? Yaakov had 12 sons. Four wives, 12 sons. It's not like Yosef was the be-all and end-all of Yaakov's offspring. It was less than 10%, just of his sons, not including daughters. So why is it say, Eilat told us Yaakov, Yosef? And the answer is, what does told us mean? Told us means offspring. Offspring are the contribution that we make, our legacy. Right? The, the, oh, it's a big part of the contribution we make to the world and the legacy that we leave. It's something that continues to, to be alive and can continue to do things after we're gone. Told us progeny are... And there's a lot of other contributions that we can make and leave other legacies that's not denying that. But offspring is a major part of our contribution and legacy. Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov represented Chesed, Gvura, and Tiferes. Chesed, Gvura, and Tiferes in the context of the human soul, of character traits in a person that we can relate to, are really, to an extent, emotional tendencies. Emotional tendencies are really primarily the things that drive our thought, speech, and action. They're the things that drive, that motivate what we do. But emotional tendencies in and of themselves don't actually achieve anything. So, now, of course, that's not to say that Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov didn't achieve anything. Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov are the primary role models that we have. But Yosef achieved something that Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov didn't. Why does the world exist? Anyone want to type up, chime in? Why did Hashem want the world to exist? For us to. Now, there are a number of reasons, right? There are a number of reasons that are brought in different forum in different contexts, but you probably knew where I was going by now. That's the one that I primarily tend to harp on about. 
so the Midrash Tan Chumah says, why did Hashem create the world? Hashem had a desire to have a dwelling place in the physical world. How do you create a dwelling place for divinity in the physical world? Now, a dwelling place for divinity in the physical world, just to clarify, doesn't mean that the world is the geographical location inside of which God exists. Because <coughs> God's already here. <coughs> there is no place in which God is absent. No place. God is everywhere. One of God's names is Makom. A literal translation of the word Makom is place. If you look in a sitter, it will generally translate the name Makom as omnipresent, which is true. Hashem is omnipresent. Hashem is present everywhere. But, technically speaking, that's not actually what the name Makom means. And I'll explain why. Now, just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't have translated it otherwise, because the true meaning of the name Makom is not something that could really be represented in one word, and I'm not suggesting that every time it says Makom and it's translated as omnipresent, they should have put in a paragraph instead of the word omnipresent. But what the name Makom actually means, there's a midrash. The, the translation of the word is space. Now, why? Why is that Hashem's name? That's the question. Go on. He takes up space. <laughs> well, depending on what you mean by that, he doesn't necessarily take up space because I'm here and Hashem's in the spa in space it's that like I am. Bring him in, he's there, but he's there anyway. But it's like consciousness. Well, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's a space. He's there. It's like a it's a hollowness, but he's there. That's true. Those are both true. Regarding what you said, the fact that you can can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't take up space is true, but. So right here, there's air, right? But if I'm here now, there's no air there anymore. There's still air there. Here, there's no air. I pushed it out of the way. There can't be air in the same space that I am. Either the molecules that make up my body are in that space, or the molecules are air in that okay. space. What happens when I move here is that some of those go there, some of them move around to here, okay. right? So physically, there can only be one thing in any space and time. There's a midrash that explains it. it says Lama Nikoshmoi Makom. Why is Hashem's name Makom? Why is God called Makom? Mipne Shehu Makomo Shel Olam Ve'Ein HaOlam Makomo. Who God is Makomo Shel Olam? He is the space, the location inside of which the universe exists. He's the location inside of which space exists. Ve'Ein HaOlam Makomo. Space is not the location inside of which God exists. He is the location inside of which space exists. So he is the ultimate Mako. He is the ultimate location because everything exists inside of God, including space. God created space. There was a time when there was no space. We can't relate to it. We can't imagine it. But it's true. So because God ultimately was the only thing that existed and God chose voluntarily to create time and to create space. Space exists inside of God. Now, by definition, God is going to be present in every point in space because every point in space exists inside of God. God's going to be there. So is God omnipresent? Yes. But omnipresent isn't what the name Mokim means. The fact that God is omnipresent is an outcome of the fact that God is Mokim. Because God is the location inside of which space exists, by definition, he's omnipresent. He's going to be everywhere. But that's not what the name Mokim means. So God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. By definition, God has to be everywhere because every point in space was created by God and exists inside of God. He's the location inside of which space exists. So God's everywhere. So when we say that God wanted to have a dwelling place in the physical world. God wants you to be brought into this world. It doesn't mean that God's absent. There's no God in this room. And then we bring God into the room because God's in the rooms in God, which means that by definition, this space and God coexist. I was going to say God's in the room, which is true, but it's not the full truth because God's not actually in the room. God exists in the same space as the room because the room's in God, if anything, right? <laughs> but there's no space in which God is not present. So what does that mean that God wants us to bring him into the world? It means that God wants us to integrate divinity in not just into the space 
of the universe that we live in, but into the fabric of the universe that we live in, into the experiences, into the procedures, into the processes of the world that we live in, of the physical world. This is holy. This is sacred. Kedusha. It's sacred. It's holy. I wouldn't put this on the floor. I wouldn't put it in the garbage. I wouldn't take it into a bathroom. Why not? Because it's holy. What does that mean? Because it's holy. Because it says in a book somewhere that it's holy and that I can't I have to treat it with respect. When we say that this is holy, that means something. What does it mean that it's holy? What it means is that this is made out of paper, which primarily came from trees. And there's writing that has been printed on these pages. These pages have ink that has been bonded to them. Because the ink that was bonded to them was done in a way that there are words of Torah. There are God's names in here. There is Torah in here. We use it to pray. We use it to learn. When we use a physical object to fulfill a mitzvah, we integrate divinity into the fabric of the object, into the processes that the object is being involved in, into the experience of the object. So it's holy because we've actually integrated divinity into the object. Now, the object was always in the same space as God. It's not that God's not in the space that this book is in. It's just that we have now made that connection, not just something that's incidental or not just something that is just a matter of them both being in the same space, but we've actually integrated divinity into the fabric and experience of the molecules that this book is made out of. And that's why God created the world. Because a union of matter and spirit is impossible. It's impossible by the rules of nature. It's impossible, it's impossible by the rules of the nature of the material world, of the physical world. It's impossible by the rules of the nature of spiritual reality. Because angels don't physically exist. This book doesn't spiritually exist. Do angels... If we define existing as something that exists made out of physical mass and energy that could hypothetically be measured physically if we had sufficient knowledge and proficiency to be able to do it, do angels exist? No, they don't. Angels do not physically exist. As defined by the parameters that define physical reality, angels do not exist. Now, in an absolute sense, do angels exist? Yes, they do. Angels are no less real than the world we know. In a reality that's defined by the reality that we know, they don't exist because they're not physical. But they are equally real. The physical world doesn't exist in terms of the parameters that define spiritual reality. So matter and spirit exist in different realities. Neither exists as far as the other is concerned. In order to facilitate communication between the two, you have to have an entity that can communicate, that can interact with both. God did something very special when he brought bo body and soul together in an individual. Each of us has a body and a soul. The fact that a body and soul work together to make an individual is in and of itself impossible by the rules of physical nature and spiritual nature. We say in the bracha of Asher Yotza, we say it every morning in morning blessings. We say it after using the restroom. God, blessed are you, God, who heals all flesh, and does wonders. Does wonders is a loose translation because it doesn't really work in English if you translate it precisely. But God does wonders. Part of the wonders are the human body. Part of that is the union of body and soul, which is a physical and spiritual impossibility. Once God has broken the rules by bringing a body and a soul together, we are now able to bring matter and spirit together because we have bodies that allow us to interact with the world. I can pick up this book. I can read the words. Thank God I have eyes. My eyes have lenses. My eyes have a retina. My eyes have rods and cones. My eyes can sense the light that's rebounding off the page. And then I have, thank God, optic nerves that trans transmit those messages to my brain. Thank God I have a brain which is made out of physical brain cells, which processes those all of that information. And then I see words. I see pictures. Because I have a physical body, I have physical eyes, I have physical hands that allow me to pick it up. I have a physical brain that can process that information and allow me to study Torah. I have physical hands that allow me to give charity, allow me to put on tefillin, allow me to light Shabbos candles, etc., etc., etc. Every time we do a mitzvah, we are interacting with the physical matter of the world. Because it's a mitzvah, it is a spiritual event, a divine event. 
which allows us, because we have a soul that allow, that means we're connected to divinity, we also have a body that allows us to interact with the world, we are able to facilitate the connection between matter and spirit. We are able to bring <coughs> divinity into the physical world, which is a physical and spiritual impossibility. But we have given, been given a special role to be able to do that. You have so a question saying, brewing. Yeah. So you're saying it's an impossibility, but then you're saying that we're doing it. Correct. Because... The same creator who created the rules that govern the physical reality and created the rules that govern spiritual reality and created both of these systems that do not allow them to interact also decided to create an exception to those rules in, in the form of an individual with a body and a soul. So you're saying according to the laws of nature, it's not like it's, it, it's like it can't be done, but we are given, we have the gift of, of getting it done. Correct. Okay. That's exactly the point that I'm trying to communicate. So, so we are here essentially to unite matter and spirit, which is impossible. Now, to unite matter and spirit, we have to be doing the right things. We have to be connecting with the source of our souls, which is divinity, which is God. We have to be doing it in a way that involves the world. Otherwise, God could have created angels and stopped there. He didn't need to go on to create people. Why did he go on to create us? Because we, angels, sing and pray to God day and night. That's all they do. Which is awesome, but it doesn't bring divinity into the matter, into the fabric and the experience of the physical world. Our actions do. Now, if we look at Yosef, Yosef's life story the life that Yosef lived, the travails he went through. Yosef exemplified this to a degree that was previously unseen. Yosef exemplified living a life of connectedness, connectedness to the source, connectedness to God, connectedness to spirituality. At the same time, being very deeply involved with the physical world and the minutiae of the running of the physical world in an extremely deeply involved way that was unprecedented. Yosef's brothers were shepherds. Yosef's ancestors even really, to an extent, had similar lives. They were people who lived relatively quiet lives as far as being, certainly Yaakov, as far as, you know, being social is concerned. They didn't have, you know, Yosef today would have, had probably the most followed account on Instagram. Yaakov would not. Yosef was the effective ruler of the foremost superpower on planet Earth at the time. Yosef was very heavily involved in the nitty-gritty, in the minutia of running Egypt, which was the superpower of the world. The primary, foremost superpower of the world at the time. And, and, and remember that when Yaakov... When Lahavdil Pare appointed Yosef to his role. He said, the only thing that's going to separate you and me is the fact that I still have my title. You're doing the work. Pare basically offloaded his entire role as leader of Egypt onto Yosef and just retained the title of Pharaoh. So Yosef had the greatest responsibility out of anyone on earth in a social sense, in a socioeconomic sense. He had the weight of the entire Egypt and really the entire world on his shoulders. Because remember that the way that this happened, the way that he got into this position was because he foretold the famine that was going to happen. He came up with the game plan to ensure that there would be food to eat. And basically everyone who lived through that famine lived through that famine thanks to Yosef's management. And Yosef was involved in the management in a very detailed way. He must have had amazing management skills. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's like magnitude. Yeah, I mean, the magnitude was just absurd. Right. So if you think about it. Like so. And it wasn't just the country. He was managing the country in a way that allowed it to be able to supply all of humanity. Or the, the entire region, at least. It wasn't just for... His brothers came to Egypt. But they weren't in Egypt. Uh -huh. But they still needed Egypt's food. 
So he not only managed the whole country, he managed the whole country to an extent that it was then able to support the entire region. Which in a way is perhaps even greater than having to manage the entire region because he didn't have the resources of the entire region. He had to manage the resources of one country to an extent to allow it to support an entire region. Okay, good question. So you're not going to let me off easy. Good. So let's keep going. And if I forget to come back to it, bring me back to it. You know what? Let me just address it now. Yosef wasn't able to affect the union in a specific, detailed, imminent way, the way that we could after the Torah was given. But he was doing it in a perhaps a more raw sense. and But most importantly, he was exemplifying, and this is where we're going, a life that balanced the two extremes. Right? Because if, let's say, for example, that I sit in my room and I study Torah and I pray in my room and I never leave my room for the rest of my life. I can be very learned. I can be a big holy tzaddik. I'm not making a vast contribution to Dira B'Tachtonim, to bringing divinity into the world, because I'm not really interacting with the world. Now, again, that's not saying that doesn't have a time and place. There are people in society whose role has to be to be people who study because we need to have leaders. We need to have people who are extremely in touch with the texts who can then guide us so that we can go out and bring it elsewhere. That's to, you know, in an effective business, you have to have leaders, you have to have executors, you have buyers and you have sellers and you have management. So, but at the same time, the bulk of us have to be getting out and getting involved in the world in one way or another. And there are many different ways to do that, many different contexts, and different people are going to be designed to do to play different roles. But the more involved we are with the world, the more opportunity we have to bring divinity into places that other people aren't going to bring it because they're not getting there. Now, again, that doesn't mean, okay, let me find the 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 baddest place on earth and go there so I can bring divinity there. Let me find the place that Shulchan Aruch, that Halacha says you're not allowed to go because it's such a bad influence. I'm going to go there and bring God there. No. Shulchan Aruch says don't go. Don't go. Simple. Um, but if the op- if my options are stay at home and just do my own thing in my own little world or go out and bring that divinity out into the world out into other people, out into other places getting out and sharing it and bringing it into the world has an important role to play. Which is better, like to sit and learn and I, I specifically didn't say better because for the most part, in terms of the bulk of the work for most of society, okay. it's important to have at least a very strong emphasis on the second one, on the outgoing approach, on the approach of getting out and being involved in the world. I didn't say better because the first one's also important and has its role to play in its time and place. And all of us have to have that too, right? Before we go out and get involved in the world, we have to start our day with grounding ourselves in the source, with davening, with learning, right. which then grounds us and gives us the foundation, the yesod, right. to be able to go out and spread it. If we don't ground ourselves in the source, then when we go out, we can lose the plot. Right. And so for the bulk of society, generally speaking, the approach should be focused on taking divinity and getting it out into the world. And again, there are a number of different ways to do that. But at the same time, the reason I didn't say more important is because number one, all of us have to also have that self-focused element to make sure that we stay grounded and connected. And number two, there are people whose role is to be that grounded element on behalf of the community so that we have people to turn to for guidance, people to turn to for grounding and connection, etc. So, what's I, I don't know if this is even a question, but what's what has more weight, like the grounded or the or is, or it doesn't or do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I think that the groundedness is so much more. I guess I, I don't really want to okay. answer that directly because it really depends on the moment, y- exactly. Where you're being led to and that, that's why I keep on saying. 
the bulk because in terms of the volume of, of the work, the vast majority of that is supposed to be outward focused. But it doesn't. So if you're going to measure weight on a scale and every, well, but it's quantity and quality. So in a way, it's like the quantity probably should be well, the groundedness. It's, it's so much because you're more important than it's about you. You know, it's always about I don't know. Yes or no? You're talking about the grounded part or the whole thing? The grounded part. <coughs> so. The gr grounded part definitely has to have an element of focus on self to make sure that we are connecting ourselves right. to the source and grounding ourselves in a way that's going to keep us connected and grounded. Um, You're always coming back to yourself. At the end of the day, my role is my role and your role is your role, right? right? Like, so that's just helping another person, but you got to get back to yourself. So. And, and you know what? We, we see this dichotomy and this kind of catch-22 across the board. It's always right. a balance of opposites because right. okay. the reality is complicated. Right. Okay. So, um, but just generally speaking, now, if the, the role of existence is to be the place in which there will be a Dear union of matter and spirit, a a dwelling place for divinity in a physical world, mm -hmm. and that was certainly the exile in an exodus from Egypt played a major role in that. The exile in Egypt, first of all, was the original, it was the prototype exile. It was the archetypal exile of the Jewish people. And it actually says in Medrash that it was all the subsequent exiles that we had in the Babylonian, the Roman, the Persian, not in that order, all the subsequent exiles that we had are actually offspring of the exile in Egypt. So exile in Egypt, the same way that when those other people came up with, came to this conclusion, the fact that this person reached a conclusion was really a derivative of the fact that the base Yosef had reached that conclusion because he had made it accessible. So the exile in Egypt was the original, the primordial, egg, not, not primordial, but the, the prototype, prototypic exile of the Jewish people and all subsequent exiles were modeled off of and, and, really descended isn't the right word, but really offshoots of it. It is and, so the sense? Is it your is, it, is that it? Um, hmm. I'm not sure. But an exile really, thinking about the purpose of the world and the purpose of existence, really exile is where it's at. Because in, in, you know, when Mashiach comes, we're not going to face challenges that we face today. We're not going to have the opportunity to bring divinity into places and elements of life that we can bring it into today. It actually says that when Mashiach comes, we're going to look back with regret. You know, now all we do is wait for Mashiach and daven for Mashiach and dream about Mashiach. When Mashiach comes, we're going to look back at the, the good old days when we could actually achieve, which we're not going to be able to do anymore. We're not going to be able to stand in the face of challenge and overcome and achieve the way we can now. So in terms of achieving a dira batachtonim, exile is where it's at. In exile, we are out in the world. We're facing challenges. We're, we're interacting with lower parts of the world, bringing divinity into those parts of the world if we, and when we're doing it right. And Yosef showed, Yosef lived a life of balancing connectedness to an extreme extent, but also being involved in the minutiae of the world to an unheard of extent. You must have been so grounded in the, in the, like in the, you know, in the, yeah. in the prayer, whatever I call it. That's right. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's, and now his brothers, his father even, they didn't interact with the world because Yosef had a special ability to get deep into the nitty gritty of the material and not just the material world, but into the materialism of the world. He was managing the finances of Egypt to the extent that they were able to support the entire region. Yosef was involved in the tiniest little details of the materialism of the world whilst staying connected, which allowed him to bring divinity into all of those distant, remote places and elements. So because the role of, ex of exile 
and specifically in this discussion, the role of the exile in Egypt was to bring divinity into the world, was to elevate divinity that's found in the world, to elevate the world itself. And when it says, when, Avra, when Hashem told Avram, Avraham that after the slavery, your children will leave Berachush Godel with great wealth, the wealth that he was referring to wasn't just the financial assets that they got, that they left with. It was also the spiritual wealth, the accumulation of achievements that they had made in terms of bringing divinity into the world, uplifting the world, elevating the world. They were in Egypt, which was not a very spiritually in tune place, and they brought divinity there and uplifted that place. That's what the purpose of the exile was. And Yosef was this enigma who was able to balance this connectedness together with being involved in the minutia. His brothers were shepherds. They stayed out in the desert and hung out with their sheep and said to Hillim and prayed and sung all day, which is amazing. But they did that because they didn't have that ground, that deep enough sense of groundedness that would allow them to balance the two opposites together that Yosef had. They didn't have that connectedness that would allow them to be in the position of Pari, to be ruling the day-to-day -day management of the entirety of Egypt to an extent that allowed it to support the entire region and still retain that focus on divinity. Even Yaakov, Yaakov personified the Mida of Tiferes from Atsilus. <coughs> but at the same time, the Posuk says, Ela told us Yaakov, this is the offspring, the progeny of Yaakov, Yosef. Because progeny, <coughs> our offspring, are the real legacy. What follows us is our true legacy, our true life. And just in super short, about Sarah, when the Torah says there's a partial called Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, because it states, because it starts, and if you look at the opening of the Torah portion, it's talking about her passing. And the bulk of that parsha is talking, or the entirety of that parsha is talking about what happened subsequent to the passing of Sarah. So why is it called the life of Sarah? It's called the life of Sarah because in her legacy that she left after she was gone, that's where you see the truth of the life that she lived. When a person leaves a lasting legacy, a lasting impact that continues to be effective after they're gone, that's the real life. That's why it's called Chaye Sarah, because this is her legacy that she left. So Yosef was the offspring of ya Yaakov. Yaakov personified Tiferes of Atzilos. Avram and Yitzchak personified Chesed and Gvur of Atzilos. Yosef was the progeny, the legacy. Yosef was the one who took all of that and brought it down into the world, which is the purpose of existence. The reason those Midas exist is to allow a Dir The reason angels exist, the reason everything exists is for Dir So... Personifying Midas of Atsilos is amazing, but the real legacy, the real offspring, is taking that and bringing it down into the musha of the material world, and that's what Yosef did. That's why it says, Ela told us Yaakov, Yosef. <coughs> Yosef is the true legacy. The legacy of the spirits of Atsilos is taking what they have to offer and integrating it into the fabric and experiences of the material world. Which is why Yaakov bowed at Yosef's bed. Yaakov was Yosef's father. The spirits of Atsilos are far more ethereal and spiritually higher up than Yosef. Yosef represented Yosod, the sphere of Yosod. Tzadik Yosod Olam, Yosef Atzadik was Yosod. Teferis is way higher up than Yosod. But at the end of the day, in terms of the purpose and in terms of legacy, Yesod is about taking all of that and packaging it up for transmission, passing it on, generating legacy. Yosef was the one who took all of that and brought it deep, deep, deep into the materialism of the physical world. And that's the purpose. That's the true legacy. That's what it was all about. That's why even Yaakov bowed at Yosef's bed. Because Yosef, what Yosef personified, what Yosef did, the balancing of the connection and the groundedness in divinity, together with being able to be deeply involved in the minutia of the material world, that's the ultimate legacy, because that's the purpose for which everything exists. The lesson for us today 
is not necessarily that we have to run for president. <laughs> um, not necessarily, I said. I didn't say you shouldn't. I just might vote for you if you run. <laughs> um, might. The lesson for us is to... to and, and remember, Yaakov, you know, Yaakov wasn't a bad guy. If we could live a life that, you know, was on par with Yaakov's, we'd be doing just fine. The fact that Yaakov wasn't Yosef doesn't mean he was a bad guy. Yosef's brothers weren't bad guys. They did some questionable things, for sure. But what we're talking about in the context of this discussion, the fact that they weren't able to do what he was able to do doesn't mean they were bad. It just means he was superior. So all of us don't have to run to try and get a connection and to bring it into the deepest, darkest places in the world. But it does mean that in the context of our lives, our opportunities our gifts that we have, we should be looking to maintain a balance of being as grounded and connected to divinity, godliness, God as possible, and try to balance that with bringing it into the world around us, integrating it into the world to the greatest extent we can in a way that makes sense for us. Because at the end of the day, the foremost priority has to be, look, Yosef's brothers didn't go and do what he did because they wouldn't have coped. It's not recommended to get involved deeply in parts of the world that are going to create a risk of us getting carried away. If there's a certain scenario where I know, yes, I can bring godliness deep into the world over there, but I also know that, you know, it's kind of risky. I'm kind of tempted by that. Stay far away. Bad idea. You know, the recommendation here is not go get involved in places that are going to threaten your spiritual security. Absolutely not. Protecting your spiritual security comes first. At the same time, within the range of things that allow us to remain spiritually secure, there are more secluded and self-centered options, and there are more outward-oriented, world-oriented options. And the ideal is to try to find that balance of both remaining connected as much as possible, but also taking what we have through that connection and bringing it out into the world as much as we can. First of all, through fulfilling mitzvahs, which means that we're engaging with the physical world and bringing divinity into it. Studying Torah, which brings divinity into our own neurons, into our brains. When we speak words, there are sound waves that we generate, which are divinity traveling through the air. And obviously, interacting with the people around us, interacting with the world around us. And the specific recommendations are going to be very different for every single person on the face of planet Earth. We all have different gifts and different opportunities. That mean we're going to be predisposed to doing this, to practicing this balance in very different ways. And there are very many different good and right ways to do it. There's no one right way. There's the best way for each of us specifically. But the lesson here from Yosef, Yosef was the one who was central in bringing them into Egypt and he was central in bringing them out of Egypt because the, 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 the slavery in Egypt as well as the exodus from Egypt was all part of the same plan. It was part of this plan of unifying matter and spirit. And Yosef, was, Yosef personified the key to that, which is balancing a groundedness to the source and to godliness and to divinity together with being involved in the world to whatever extent we can safely and bringing divinity into the world by means of doing that. Have a good week, everybody. And Emir Hashem, I think we'll do it again next week. Same time, same place. All the best.